Hello everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Science Friday live stream. I'm Diana. I am the experiences manager for Science Friday and I am joining you from a slightly cooler day here in Brooklyn, New York. It is perfectly fall and I hope that wherever you are joining us from, it is beautiful as well. Speaking of which, we want to know where are you joining us from today? A few people have already started to let us know in the chat. Let's take a look. We've got some people from Ashland, Kentucky, Albuquerque, Gardner, North Carolina, Bloomington, Indiana, Cleveland, Baltimore. I'm so excited that you are all joining us here today um, for this amazing conversation that we're going to have starting soon. You can join us in the chat by signing into a YouTube account and uh, start chatting with us then uh, and get your questions ready because that's how you're going to send us your questions for today's live stream. If you don't know us, we like to say that Science Friday is your one-stop shop for all things science news. We're well known for our weekly radio show, which broadcasts every week on you guessed it, Fridays at 2 p.m. Eastern. You can listen to us live every week on your local radio station or by going to sciencefriday.com and clicking the listen banner at the top of the page. There's also all kinds of cool stuff on our website. So again, sciencefriday.com is the place to do that. But today we are talking about this month's book club pick, which is The Future Earth, a radical vision for what's possible in the age of warming, which combines interviews, scientific research, and impressive reporting to outline how humans can implement real world solutions to the climate crisis we have caused by author and meteorologist Eric Holthouse. If you want to join your fellow readers to discuss this and our other book club picks, we read a new book, book every single month. You can do that on our community site. Um, you can go to sciencefriday.com slash book club to find out everything you need to know about that. It's a great place. I'm sure there are some community members joining us in the chat right now. A kind reminder to everyone before we get started, Science Friday is committed to providing a welcoming and harassment-free environment for members of all ethnicities, ages, gender and trans statuses, sexual orientations, physical abilities, national origin beliefs and any other dimension of diversity. We've created a code of conduct, which you can read in its entirety on our community space to help us create a safe and positive community experience for all and believe that providing clear expectations is a necessary part of building a respectful community. So if you wanna read the full um, code of conduct that is on our community uh, site, but I've put the basics in the chat, which read, be supportive and respectful when speaking with one another or asking questions in the comments. Share generously and listen closely. You can add your thoughts throughout, even if they aren't strictly questions for our guest. We're gonna do our best to stay on topic today as we're here to discuss this month's book club pick, The Future Earth and related topics with the author and special guests. And 
we reserve the right to ban anyone who engages in demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior in the chat today. So with all of that out of the way, it is officially time to welcome our special guest. So thanks for sticking with me. First, I want to welcome Eric Holthaus. He is a meteorologist and climate journalist based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He is the author of The Future Earth, A Radical Vision for What's Possible in the Age of Warming, which is the Sci-Fi Book Club's read this October. Welcome to the live stream, Eric. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited too. And uh, we are also being joined by Robbie Parks, who is an environmental epidemiologist who work focuses on climate related exposures, public health and equity. He's an assistant professor of environmental health sciences at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health based in uh, New York City. Thanks for being here, Robbie. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Amazing. Well, a kind reminder to our audience, we want your questions. So if you have a question, you can post it literally anytime in the chat and we will get to them as soon as we are able to do so. So um, let's just start off, uh, I, I want to say with an easy question, but um, I suspect it's not as easy as we might expect. But um, Eric, can you just describe for us in your own words what it is if people were to pick up the future earth, what, what they should expect and why you decided to write it. Yeah. So thank you so much for this question and thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's like such a huge honor. Like I, you know, helped develop my public speaking voice modeled in part off of science Friday. And so it's just like, it's such a great full circle thing to be here. Um, I think that, um, this book was really um, hugely a labor of love. I know people probably say that a lot about their their books. Um, um, I feel like, you know, this first idea for a book came when, um, when I was expecting uh, my first child. Um, this was now like almost 10 years ago. Um, and I was like, I just, I can't, I mean, I've been working on climate for like 15 years at that point. And I was like, I, uh, it, everything like in my brain changed. And like, I know like my parents have been telling me that my whole life was like, oh, well, your life will be totally different once you have a kid. And it's like, ah, eh, no, I don't really believe that. How could my life change so much? But like, that's what happened. And, um, and, and I was like, I, I just need to say some things to my kid. And so like the first draft, the proposal and all of that was intended to be like, here is my hope for you and what is possible for you in your life and what I'm going to be doing for you and what I would hopefully hope that we as society can do for each other. And so it really like started off as as that very personal personal letter, almost like a letter. And so... Um, so then, uh, you know, like workshopped it, um, with the, with the, um, with my editor, with my, um, with my agent and, um, it evolved into this sort of like chronology of what the, what the world could be like over the next 30 years. Um, um, if we do everything that, you know, scientists say is necessary, and if we do everything that we, I think that we want to do for each other, you know, like this is what politicians say that we want to do, but then we they don't actually see it happening. And so mm -hmm. like a lot of us are feeling this anxiety or, you know, like, well, clock's ticking, you know, we're running out of time. When's this all going to change? How fast is this going to happen? And, you know, in part of my research for the book studying um, basically, you know, like social revolutions, mm. it almost always happens faster than people expect it to like change can come very fast in the positive ways and i just had to keep reminding myself you know like i have this baby you know i also love the world so much and like i really want this change to happen and so this is this book is like my way of manifesting that change into the world i love that yeah i feel like that's a really great description of the book as well some people asked me how I chose this book in, you know, a landscape of lots of climate books. Um, and I think that a, I wanted a book that did present that positive 
I don't want to say positivity, but optimism. Here's what could be possible if we did everything right. And I think it's hard for people to focus on that and really concentrate on the what's possible. And so thank you for doing all of that imagining for us so that we could read your book together. Thank you. Robbie, can you tell us, uh, environmental epidemiologist, what does that mean? What? How did you get into this field? Well, thanks again for uh, allowing me to be here. You know, Science Friday and, and both Science Friday and, and Eric uh, and his work are, are huge, um, uh, are hugely admirable of both. So um, I'm really, really happy to be here. I mean, in terms of what an environmental epidemiologist does, so largely focusing on who is exposed to climate change, uh, where is it happening, and and also to be most useful, what needs to be done to enact the most positive change and restitution. And so that's a very broad description. But the reason I love uh, working in this space is because it's inherently, uh, you know, uh, relevant to people's lives if mm. it's done well and in a positive way. And also, I think, you know, there's an opportunity here to be inherent to all forms of justice in the work and to promote. And, you know, I really loved reading Eric's book and, and part the, one of the quotes, and I think I identified with being stubbornly optimistic. And I find that I'm a stubborn optimist, despite everything going on. I really identified with, with uh, Eric's characterization of, of, of that. So, so I think part of the work is a healthy dose of optimism but also realism. And so that's largely what my day-to-day -day focuses on. And what kind of, what does your study like and your research sort of look like? If, if we were to sit down with you on a day-to-day -day basis in, in Colombia, what, what would we watch you doing? I know that's probably what we would watch you doing is a lot of this as well. This is like typing ends up being a lot of what scientists do and meetings as well. But um, just tell us a little bit about your sort of your, like your day to day and, and what it looks like to do your work. Well, I, honestly, I love my work. I love the day to day. I mean, I could complain like anyone about work, but I really actually look forward to every day. So beyond all the sort of education element of it, uh, the research element of it is huge mentoring. Uh, students and, and other uh, professionals and faculty, mm. but really is trying to identify with a good strategy, where is the uh, biggest gains from my research made in the climate and health space? So for example, mm. is it for people who are largely have historically been ignored? So incarcerated populations, what's happening with the temperature profile of those um, uh, communities? And is there a way that we can create a study which will highlight that and, and then work with press and communities uh, locally and, and globally to try and highlight those issues. So it's really connecting the dots between seeing an issue uh, and recognizing an issue to public health relevant to climate change, and then taking that through to research. And that research can be, you know, community research, which could be uh, placing sensors and working with communities to try and understand and map their temperature in their community in New York City in particular. It could be national or international studies of the impact of hurricanes on on how people um, get sick and die and the long-term impacts on that. And that could be for all sorts of reasons, cardiovascular disease and also mental and, and health and well-being. Um, and then it also goes to sort of governance issue, like how do we plug mm -hmm. into uh, policy? So talking to policymakers, both of the city and, 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 and you know, at the COP, uh, the UN COP level as well. So being mm -hmm. an observer, say, at those big conferences is sort of, you know, whatever people think of those conferences, are, you know, is, is an important component too. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, when you're writing a book like the one that you're writing, where does the research come in? Because it, it, it reads like a sort of like, your, your book reads like a, a historical sort of like look back at, at the you know, the, the decades that haven't happened yet. And so it's, what's nice about that is it, it feels like a, a future that is already written in some ways, which I, I liked reading because again, it, it sort of like supplants that optimism sort of like right in your face. We're going to be optimistic about this. Here's what happened if we did everything right. Mm -hmm. um, but it might not be obvious to some readers sort of like how you put together a book like that with research. So, so what does that process look like? Yeah, so I did a lot of um, 
of interviews, um, mm. talking to people, especially people who are at the front lines, you know, experiencing um, climate change already, um, people who have studied um, uh, rapid transitions, whether it's economics or politics or mm -hmm. um, social movements. Um, and then kind of like collecting um, recommendations, like what, what Robbie just talked about of like, what, like, what's the, what's the most effective things that we can do right now? Um, and it's not always the sort of like sexiest things to, to think about. Um, a, a lot of it is, is like transparency and, and data access and, and that sorts of things are like leveling the playing field of, of who can make decisions. And so like, you know, I, I, I put in this, um, this section in the book on radical democracy of like, what would it be like to transform the way we make decisions mm. in America specifically? Because it feels broken right now. I mean, like you're seeing what's happening in Congress right now. It's just like almost a farce of a decision-making body. So like how, what would it actually look like and what's the time scale to, you know, like push reset um, in this emergency mo moment? Um, that we have that affects everything. Um, and again, this is like what I said at the beginning of this show is like, it feels like this is what everyone wants, but we just don't agree on how to do it. So if mm. we just started, uh, <laughs> sometimes like we just take those recommendations and do it. So like there's this, this movement of, um, I forget what it's called now, like my, my post It's Wednesday. Brain. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, um, the citizens assembly, I think that's mm. what it's called, you know, uh, uh, where, where, you know, let's, let's say Congress could delegate this decision-making body of say, like, we're gonna, we're gonna nominate like almost like jury duty, a hundred people and make sure that all of them are, are, you know, like representative of America, you know, like what the Senate U S Senate should be, <laughs> but these mm -hmm. are like average everyday people. Right. It's like your job is to come up with recommendations and you have like the ability to ask any questions of anyone uh, about how do we do that? So, like, how do we move forward? Our our job is to cut U.S. climate uh, carbon emissions by 50 percent in the next what we have seven and <laughs> six and a half years <laughs> to do mm -hmm. that. Like, what are what's the most equitable way that we can do that? And it's going to look like, you know, um a mix of carrots and sticks right like we can encourage people to do um to do activities that are in everyone's best interest and we can also sort of like hold to account those who who refuse to do that so and again i feel like this is what this is if you do surveys of the american population or even the global population you know, it's a bipartisan issue at this point is like 75, 80 percent of people want urgent climate action. It's just not it's not really the debate that it was whenever I first started this work in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Robbie, do you find that as you're doing your research, because I know part of your research is also so you're looking at studies. Do you do like personal interviews with people or is, is that not part of your work and do you wish it was do you get a chance to do interviews kind of like Eric did for his his book yeah I mean so I have different strands of my work I mean certainly for the large-scale studies uh that that isn't really part of it but the, the community work trying to survey and understand how people feel about their indoor temperatures both in winter and the summer for example under climate change and how it is affecting their mood and their sense of power or powerlessness I, and and frankly the word i always think of is dignity mm -hmm. how, how people are trying to live with dignity going forward because our lives you know seemingly these large forces are moving our lives and when you feel powerless like all of us often do especially looking at Congress in the US or looking at climate change worldwide, that feeling that we don't have power and the feeling that at one point, at any point, our lives could, could be removed from that dignity mm -hmm. uh, or dignity could be removed. Th those are the, the things I hear about when I talk in the community work that uh, I'm, I'm working on. Um, of course, I think, you know, 
I always think of the phrase, no stories without data, no data without stories. Mm -hmm. Both are really important to uh, act as levers, particularly in public health, in the, in, the, in the context of climate change. So I think they're both equally important. The idea that understanding how people feel and, and see issues pertaining to climate change and health, but also actually quantifying that because both have a lot of power and in fact, multiplicative power together. So uh, that's how I feel. What role does optimism play in your work, Robbie? Do you feel like you're, you have to model optimism for others? And to, like, I, I imagine that as someone, if you were to say to someone, I'm an environmental ep epidemiologist, a lot of my work has to do with climate change, especially in regards to marginalized communities, that they might say, wow, that sounds hard. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have to respond with optimism? Do you meet them where they are? How, do, how does that sort of play in your role, like while you're talking about your work and how, as you are doing your work? I think, you know, like like Eric said, I mean, optimism is, you know, in, in throughout the book, I do see that optimism and I, and, I, and I think it's essential. But for me, you know, the day to day of working in, in my field and my line of work as an academic, you know, beyond just being worried about being tired and, and having enough energy to get through mm. the day. I, I feed off the optimism and, and enthusiasm of students and, and other people who I uh, con contact and, and work with every day. So I do find myself being stubbornly optimistic, but I think I'm very, very fortunate that I work and 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 collaborate with people who, who also feed a lot of energy. In. And I think that what that says, and you know, like, like the three of us on this call and I'm sure many of the listeners is that we are a community and we, we do need each other and we do need mm. each other to get that optimism and, and push it through because without community, we're just all, you know, automatons living in rooms by ourselves without anything to live for. So I think, you know, while I do like to think I am a source of optimism, I do think that every day I get it from everyone else I in interact with, which I think is really a compliment to to society that I live in anyway. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I might have to follow you around for a few days, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, Very your well. book was Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, Eric, your book was published in 2020. And of course, things are different than some of the things you predicted back when you finished back in I'm a, I'm guessing 2019, you handed it in. You're like, can't wait to see the future. Um, <laughs> and some things have, have changed, of course. But I'm I'm excited to hear about some of the things um, that you either see that ha have happened that you kind of like were like, mm -hmm. see, we can do it, or things that we're on the path towards accomplishing in terms of climate change mitigation. Right. Yeah. So I mean. The, the the two things that really surprised me of a, a, a sort of like things changing faster than I thought, um, uh, you know, number one, COVID, obviously, like um, the whole world changed overnight. I mean, mm -hmm. really in the spa span of, you know, two weeks or so, <laughs> it felt like, you know, it was hard to imagine your life before those two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and... And this this sense of overwhelming, as happens, you know, there's been a lot of research on this, is like um, during disasters and immediately following disasters is the time when people are willing to make long, long scale, you know, large scale, long duration change. Um, you know, whether that is, um, is talking about, okay, we're going to, totally revamp the social safety net of the United States, which kind of did, did happen, right? Like it, temporarily. Um, and um, our sense of responsibility for each other during COVID became incredibly profound, you know, overnight. Like we had, you know, people almost, I mean, obviously like there, there were problems with like, with vaccines and masking and like, it became this massive political issue as would always happen when something happens quickly, you'll have people that are resistant to it for any reason. But the overwhelming majority of people and enough people said, this is something I wanna do for, for my community. 
um, and I want to protect, I want to do it to protect them and not just protect myself. Um, and yeah. that's huge. Like that, like we, I think we, we don't often give that enough credit for what it was. Like we came out for each other. We really did. And it saved, you know, potentially millions of lives. So that's a huge thing that we've just done for each other in the last three or four years. Um, and the other thing um, I think that stands out for me is that um, the 2020 pre presidential election could have gone any number of ways. And without getting too far into politics, you know, like what ended up being the front runner and the winner of the election listened in whatever capacity that he could to climate activists and became the self-described climate president. And like that was not expected from me. Like he was, you know, like Joe Biden is, uh, you know, like ran as a moderate um, in the Democratic Party. And he said, you know, climate justice is going to be a center point of my presidency. And he has done a lot of things for that. So like, again, with leaving politics aside, um, that's something that I honestly was only expecting to happen, like a super far progressive left wing um, presidential candidate to say. Mm -hmm. And it mean it meant for me that climate change is now and will always be this like gathering issue rather than a dividing issue, which is huge to me. Like that is that is like a core part of American politics now for the rest of our lives is going to be climate change. Mm -hmm. And that is not something that I expected to happen so soon. It's something that I put in the sort of fantasy world if everything goes right in, in the book. In the 2020 election, I said, we're going to get a climate president. And we did. Yeah, that's super interesting. It's not something I was clocking necessarily when I was reading your book, but you're completely right. It is right. I wrote like, it in 2019 before the primaries even started. So I was like, yeah. something's going to happen because it has to happen. Yeah, yeah. It would. It's like both a like blessing and a curse that it feels like climate is going to be a part of these yeah. political conversations for the future. I'm glad if, if we're living through the, the things we're currently living through, I would rather us be talking about it than not talking about it. But um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's super, it's really interesting that you said that. So um, we've got some great questions from the audience. Um, while we're taking some of those, I also want to encourage our audience to um Post like what keeps you hopeful and optimistic about climate change and climate mitigation and what we're going through right now together. Um, we like Robbie, Eric, and I are going to be talking about that for the next you know thirty minutes or so that we're together. Um, but we would love in the chat if you would post what keeps you hopeful and optimistic as well, both for each other, um, and we may respond to some of the things that you post in there too. So. Um, while we're answering some questions from the audience, which um, I've got, we've got a couple right here. I'm going to, um, let's see, we were just talking a little bit about um, the COVID pandemic, and we've got a question here from uh, Lee that reads, how do we transition in the area of healthcare as more pandemics are expected due to climate change, yet we have a large carbon footprint due to single-use disposables mm -hmm. and plastics? Um, Robbie, I'm going to ask you first, does this topic ever come up in your research? Is there is there sort of like a um, uh, scientific uh, gathering around this idea of disposables, carbon footprint when it comes to public health? Absolutely. I think, you know, in terms of pandemics and climate change, there, there is a lot of good research uh, by, by colleagues uh, worldwide about zoonotic diseases, um, not just by the favorability of the climate uh, for those uh, diseases, viruses, bacteria to thrive, but also the way that animals will move around. But and, and it really just speaks to the reason I think climate change and pandemics have a large crossover is it sort of draws back down to the idea that we have been convinced or we've convinced ourselves as as a, a species that we are masters of the earth rather than stewards of the earth and i think that's both how pandemics and climate change uh, have a commonality i think mm -hmm. and i think you know in terms of the way we build resilience people talk about disposals and plastics as bad things of course they are you know we want to get rid of them in the oceans and things like that however when there is a pandemic 
I don't think we're going to not use plastics. But that really isn't the, 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 the crux of it. I believe the crux of it is how do we avoid having pandemics which are as bad as COVID was? Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, we, we changed our society maybe temporarily, but I think there were, you know, a lot of people who died who didn't need to. Um, um, but and yet the, one of the drivers behind that was our way that we got together in an, in a way that allowed such an emergency to be dealt with. And of course, in that moment, it's not the sort of time really that people want to listen to the fact that uh, they shouldn't be using plastic when they when they actually have to to save their lives. So really, it's, it's like taking a step back and the interventions being at a longer term time scale. And it sort of talks to the mitigation of climate change, talks to the elimination of plastic, which, of course, are both really, really essential uh, sort of endeavours, critical to the survival of of all um, life on Earth. Um, so, so I think when I think about this kind of question, I think what is the time scale we're dealing with, and how do we remain conscious of the different time scales of dealing with disasters when we are thinking about these issues? Eric, is there anything else you want to add? Any parts of your book that highlight this issue as well? Um, I think that, you know, it it's sort of, I mean, for me, like I'm a, I'm a client, climate scientist and um, thinking about time scales, um, I, I go back to, you know, the carbon, like, the carbon budget for the earth and in sort of like the IPCC recommendations is like, it's a pretty clear time scale, you know? Um, and, and that's why I framed the book around the next 30 years, because that's kind of when everything has to happen. Um, so mm -hmm. um, plastics are really on a much longer time scale than that. And so that's why I haven't really thought or worked much around um, plastics because it's kind of, well, I mean, I feel like, well, let's fix the, I mean, not fix, but like, let's stabilize the climate first, and then we can kind of worry about um, the larger, longer term problems later, um, mm. which is, I guess, kind of the same way that, that Robbie framed it in terms of a, a pandemic, like, you got to focus on preserving society, <laughs> and then you can work on longer, and, and, and you know, I'm thinking about this, I, um, I interviewed a, a, a climate activist in Russia for the book, and it didn't actually, the interview didn't make it into the book, but but I interviewed him and members of his family of like, how does it feel to have, um, have a loved one take personal risks for society in a place like Russia? Mm -hmm. while all this is happening um you know he he he's been in prison um for protesting um he, he's at great personal you know like very much um putting his life into his own hands and he like in his words he couldn't see another way like he just had mm -hmm. to do it like he he studied music and he was like what what good is music if we don't have an earth so but like I, I also get that you have to have joy and you have to um, you have to, to to work on climate at the same time. But but his, like the way his family was just ta talking about it is like, well, when we're in Russia, we don't have the luxury of worrying about these long term problems. We have to focus on eating and survival and like making ends meet. And I think that that is how, you know, billions of people around the world live um right now and it, it's difficult to focus it's difficult to frame climate as a, as a global issue when you aren't putting marginalized populations first in your decision making and that's why work like Robbie's is so important um in 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 that um we aren't going to have a successful climate movement unless it um centers uh marginalized people and and figures out paths forward that put um, sort of um, that uh, the group of people who have been harmed the most by climate change um, at the middle. Yeah, um, I totally agree, Eric. I think, you know, you talk about the stewardship economy 
and and sort of return of indigenous land and i think you know the idea is there really about you know not being an expert on that at all but just how it chimes in with the idea of sustainable uh, life and how we you know really need to see ourselves as part of the world not masters of it and i think mm -hmm. you know your book gave me a lot of inspiration for how we actually get that to practically you know be enacted and i think you know that that was very insp inspiring for me so you know i appreciate that yeah thanks yeah um i i know that um there was one question as well um in the comments yes. about about ownership yes um so i think that um in terms of um let's see the question was something like um i could read it yeah uh, tell us more about the changes needed around ownership uh private property is such a strong legal process at this point in time so i think that um so I, I did include that section in the book about um, reimagining um, reimagining this um, the word ownership as as kind of like in the back of my head that that felt like the theme that everyone was trying to talk about but wasn't really able to articulate um, in terms of of getting um, a sense on what caused climate change. Um, and how do we imagine a society where something like climate change really can't happen again? And I think that, um, I think that that, you know, eventually, and, and, you know, in, in my book, I have it, um, sort of like this example of, so we've survived, some, mo most of us, uh, have survived COVID. Um, we have that in our minds now as a way a partial model for other other um, society-wide transitions. Um, so if we are in this world where over the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, we make massive changes um, related to climate change, um, how, um, how could it, how could we then take that next step towards things like plastics or things like ownership or things like racism or things like, you know, the return of indigenous lands that were stolen. Um, these are directly, these directly follow these sorts of collective actions that we would have to take on climate. Um, and I think that we could have then, you know, in, in my, in my book, I have in the 2040s in leading up to 2050, this you know, like nation or global summit on um, the atmosphere, like how do we move forward now that we've stabilized climate emissions? Um, and I talk about like, well, maybe we could then think about having collective ownership over the atmosphere in like a real tangible way. And then a follow on decision from that being, let's start some form of, of controlled geoengineering to bring the temperature back down more quickly than it would otherwise, and to distribute, you know, sort of like the benefits and losses of that process. So where it's an equitable process and we can bring, you know, the really stabilize the climate in a, in a meaningful way within our lifetimes. Because right now it's like, there's just a paper that came out yesterday that's like, well, now like we are 100% certain that the West Antarctic ice sheet will collapse, but we don't know if it'll be decades or years or, or, but we know that it will happen now. Like that's the latest evidence. And it's just like, okay, well, wow. Uh, <laughs> how do we move forward from that? Um, in, in like, in the recommendations from the study's author were along the lines of, well, there's still the East Antarctic ice sheet. That's like 80 meters of sea level rise. Like, so we're gonna have three meters of sea level rise, but maybe we can avoid that 80 meters of sea level rise. And like, that's a 22nd century problem. So, but by 2050, if things, you know, sort of go the way we need them to go, then we can start making those decisions about the 22nd century saying like, 
let's do any, everything we can to prevent the loss of the East Antarctic ice sheet because that would totally, you know, remake the world uh, 80 meters of sea level rise. Um, yeah, that, like that's just an example of of collective ownership and how it might manifest. But I'm also in the book talk about individual ownership versus, um, you know, like individual ownership of my exact house. You know, I, I don't know how to, I, I don't, I, I don't know how to move on, um, on, on that micro scale, but like, it gives you an example, um, if we do it for climate. Yeah. I, th I think just that, that makes me think Eric of, of, uh, the transition to, um, different forms of transport and, you know, right. of course, you know, is a just transition where we're just replacing cars with electric cars or right. is our ownership of transport, you know, the way we think about getting around cities and even between cities and, and in rural areas, um, do we have to rethink the, the sort of ownership of that? And, and, right. and I think we, I think that the answer is we likely do. I mean, if we're going to, you know, mitigate climate change as, 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 as best we can. And I think it sort of speaks to all the different elements of, of our lives really like um but it just made me think really i think i saw a comment about electric vehicles and i right. i think we we can't just take what how we live now and then just swap it out for electric things i think then yeah. there's a, a whole different way of living right for sure and and that's kind of what i'm asking readers to do in the book is say like let's go back back a couple more steps beyond just like how do you power your house um but it's more like what is a house for and it's like, why do we have houses? Why do I have a single family house in a city where there's a housing shortage? Like, could we reimagine this? Like, do I have the right to own my backyard and use it for whatever I want in a city where I could build a house th there and like provide, you know, public housing in my own space? Like, but the city of Minneapolis doesn't let me do that right now because of weird property rules. Like, that's not fair really to society, like that law needs to change. Thank you both so much for continuing on while my internet decided to just have a little hiccup, but um, okay. <laughs> I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, I, speaking of this idea sort of of ownership is sort of changing, you know, the, we're talking about systemic change now, and we're also talking a little bit about sort of like power structures. One of our community members responded to a discussion question that we had um, in regards to this idea about radical change. Um, one of them said, power holders are creating chaos that prevents action. And another said, as other members have indicated, idealism is killed by the cold, cruel world of wars, etc. There ought to be a policy and procedures manual for implementing the idealism into practice. I wonder what you think of that, Eric. Do you think of your book as something like something akin to that, or do you sort of wish that there was this this manual for idealism? I mean, I'm not going to be as, <laughs> as as like egotistical to say like this is a a manual, but it's an example of what something like that could be, um, and it's just written by me, right? I don't know anything about this stuff. Like, <laughs> I wrote a book, but that's just one <laughs> book. Um, so and i think you know like we're pointing to like the the back matter of my book which was um written by um by like um some friends of mine um to um to give examples of you know like discussions of like how do you create that kind of a manual for you and your small groups or your communities? Like mm. everyone has the mm -hmm. ability to create something like that for themselves or in their communities. And so I think it really does have to happen case by case basis. Um, and, and, and I think that um, that is sort of how we get through uh, is just like that sort of radical democratization of the process yeah i think if you yeah yeah i mean you, you can you can use you can use shocks and disasters in in the opposite way you know naomi klein talks about shock doctrine and how that could be used for absolutely disastrous policies but as eric alluded to you know they are opportunities to, for us to completely rethink society and i think certainly in america and and, and uh, europe and other places in the world 
like world wars and, and climate disasters have been an opportunity. And it, sometimes we've taken, you know, reforming the way we take care of people, reforming the way we care about people in, in, in a healthcare setting. Um, those can be changed relatively quickly, but unfortunately they, they often do take us to rethink when we're in the midst of a crisis. So, you know, I think we have to use that sort of shock doctrine spirit, but in for good, because I think that's, we, we have a big impetus now to do that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. We've got another question in the chat from Dale, which reads, um, the cost of not acting immediately to address climate change is often ignored while focusing on the cost of action. How can we reverse that? I know it's a really big question. We won't answer it exactly, mm -hmm. but what do you think, Eric? What is your best sort of like ideas for how we can sort of flip the scales on this? Yeah, I mean, the way I think about that question question is that, um, you know, I, I know that that something, you know, I mean, I'm driven by the science and in, in writing this book of like, obviously, we don't want to have to remake the entire world on a, a 27, 26 and a half year time scale. But, um, but that's what the science says is necessary. Um, and so being driven by the science um, here, um, we, we, we know that that has to happen regardless of what is politi politically possible. Um, so that, that kind of, um, th those sorts of costs uh, of, of waiting increase the longer you wait right so so and i think that just for me framing it as like uh framing it in terms of um of benefits rather than costs means more personally i mean mm -hmm. that's just because i'm like by nature an optimistic person but it's like this is what we'll get for this rather than this is what it this is how hard it will be to get there you know like we will we we can have a thriving world where everyone um, has what they need to like Robbie said live with dignity. Um, mm -hmm. That is possible, and so w why wouldn't we want to pay for that? How, no matter how much it costs, right? Because the end goal is something that is good for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. I, I just, just quickly, I mean, I totally agree with Eric. I think but when people talk about the cost of climate action, I think yeah, in some ways it's a completely um, artificial cost analysis because people aren't really putting the cost on the on the value of a human life in that sense or value of coral reefs or value of maintaining nature, maintaining a tree. What value do you put on a tree? People will put values on them, but they're entirely, you know, almost absurd sometimes what people right. do to, come to, to actually value those things. And so, like, you know, they're priceless objects. So if you talk about the cost, I would talk about the cost of losing priceless objects such as trees, such as the marine life. I mean, entire species. Entire, spe entire so ecosystems, right. Exactly. And so so I always think about this cost idea as, 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 as kind of... Um, Design not to to really be in good faith. Actually, I think it's actually not right. a good faith argument. Right. Yeah. yeah. Really interesting. Thank you both. Um, we only have a few minutes left. Somehow, it has been almost <laughs> fifty minutes since we've been together. Um, I want to highlight some of the things that our audience has said that they're keeps them hopeful and optimistic in terms of climate change. Um, Jody says that young people give them hope, which um, Eric, you talk a little bit about in your book as well, right? I think you maybe even start off your 2030 to 2040 about like how and when young people are going to sort of like take the mantle and, and run. Right. Yeah. Celine, the story of Selena Leem and in, um, in the Marshall Islands, um, mm -hmm. you know, like <laughs> standing up in front of the world and saying, you know, like, physically handing out pieces of her homeland to like heads of state and saying, I don't care who you are. You have to do this. Like, like there are hundreds of millions of people just like me that our existence depends on you. And not just that, not just us people, but 
our entire way of living and everything that we know. You know, in the case of the Marshall Islands, like the islands themselves, like her homeland will be gone. It won't exist anymore above water. And like, it's just, it, it was just unfathomable for me to, you know, imagine a person who has, you know, a hundred generations of experience in this one place and have that just be gone is unthinkable. Yeah. We've got Barbara here who says that um, they've seen many businesses moving forward with changes to their companies that are more eco-friendly. Um, and that's done despite a change of political opinions. Um, Eric, you mentioned this in your book, you're very careful about the we of, of the thing. Um, you, you speak a lot about we, but you're very clear that like, you know, one by one, each of us cannot make these big changes. There do also, it needs to be um, societal as well as, you know, the, top few companies that are doing much of the decision making and polluting and choice be making choices for the rest of us that we kind of have to live with. Um, those things are things that we we can, you know, do individual action towards but cannot as individuals make changes uh, about. Um, Robbie, does your research also talk a, a little bit about this idea of like, um, what sort of structural changes need to be made in order for like people to live with more dignity in a, in a climate, uh, especially those, like I said, who um, are living in as, as marginalized communities. Yeah. I mean, of course there are differential effects uh, of climate, such as a hurricane hitting two parallel communities that are affected differently. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, one community which is racialized as minority could, could be impacted more and, and, and my and other works shows that that's largely true. Um, but then in terms of what to do about it for restitution, if you then look at, for example, in a disaster setting, what in the long term is the construct of a city in those poor areas, power, cheap power lines overhead, cheap housing materials, what do you expect to happen if there's a disaster? Of course, it makes complete sense that, you know, when you compare, say, areas of Queens in New York with up west side, for example, that, you know, mm. there's going to be differential impacts. And that's nothing to do with the kind of people who live there. It's to do with the material and the situation they're provided. And so, yeah, it does sort of indirectly speak to that. But some of my research is really looking at what is driving differential impacts based on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And infrastructure is one of those long term resilience plans that we can have for disasters. And that needs to be done in an equitable way. So, yes. Yeah. Amazing. Just real quickly, um, none of this happens without people demanding it. Um, so I, I think that's what I say in the book, too, is that like we have this this line of evidence from Erica Shenoweth's work um, that it takes um, three and a half percent of of um, of any given population to basically be on the streets demanding change. And then in the history of nonviolent protest of the 20th century, that is successful every single time. So like she could not they could not find uh, an example of uh, of when that many people. And right before COVID, there was um, in New Zealand, um, the climate protests, you know, the school strikes movement reached that point. And the prime minister responded, like within weeks to change the the nation's climate laws. Um, so we do have that example of it of it being successful with a small number of people relatively. So, you know, there was, was some comments in, in the chat about like, well, you know, do we need to convince every single person to do this? No, we don't. Like, there's enough of us to demand this change that, that it happens. I think we might have lost Diane again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I love that Sorry. idea. And I think, yeah. I, yeah, just to, fin you know, I, I think, you know, Eric, I think that, that I learned a lot from that idea about how, you know, revolutions and, and, and progress, radical progress happens because it's really like that number three or three and a half percent. It's largely like most people would sort of implicitly support it. But then to, to look at there's enough people there to actually right. take action, then then it becomes, oh, we can actually do this. And I think 
the, the inspiring fact is that number is relatively low. And, uh, you know, I th think you've touched on some really good examples of how that happens. Um, so. Right, right. Yeah, like, you know, that number is not the 70% of people who support, in theory, climate policies in the United States. It's like, how many of you are willing and able with your given privilege to be physically out in the streets, physically demanding the change, refusing to cooperate with the system until that change is made. Um, and that is actually like, you know, that's like about 10 million, 20 million people in the US. That's a lot of people, that 3%. Um, and we can get there. I asked a question in our community site about that very particular question, would you participate in a global strike or protest? And a lot of people said, I already have, or yes, I would. But a lot of people had questions, you know, about its accessibility, it's right. the safety around it. So there's so many questions out there about these kinds of things. But I do think that more and more people, um, hopefully, are thinking more about uh, possibilities and where they can, you know, where, what they can do with their time and their attention as well. It seems like a lot of people here with us today are doing that. So I think thanks to everyone who is doing that. Um, well, I, we've got time for just one question. I did want to ask um, COP28 begins in just over a month. What are you both hoping to see as part of this conference? I know, Robbie, you talked a little bit about how and how much a conference like this does as relative to how much it talks about, but um, what are you hoping to hear or see at this conference this year? So, I mean, the short answer, I mean, you know, this is the first conference where cl climate and health is really at the f forefront. So for me, it, it makes a lot of sense to try and use that as a lever. Other levers haven't worked. So this this may be a good lever to, to try and enact mm -hmm. policy. But really, when in the practical terms, loss and damage, I think, you know, being at the last one, uh, loss and damage, everyone talked a good game. It seems like in the run up to this one, they haven't agreed on this fund. And so, like, we talk a good game about loss and damage, but where where's the money you know and so for you know loss and damage i.e if a if a caribbean island is flattened how do we mm. how do we pay for the restitution such that that caribbean island or wherever doesn't have crippling loans that they can never repay and therefore never redevelop their country um mm. that's the critical issue one of the critical issues for me that i'm particularly interested in eric what about you what you yeah i mean so similar I th and i think also i've been really inspired um by sort of the you know cop gets all of the news headlines um there's also parallel um forums that happen mm. in coordination with cop um and I I honestly to be like ex perfectly blunt at this point trying different strategies besides cop um in parallel you sort of like siphon off that attention and say like here's other ways of of making um decisions whether it, um you know i don't know enough about the un process but i mean like there are there are like these civil society um demands that historically have not been heard at cop and like loss and damage is right up there at the top um so are, are there other ways of organizing the world um, to demand the same things um, in parallel with the COP process? Um, so just yeah. like watching that evolve as well. Amazing. Thank you both so much for taking the time to be here today to talk to our audience and to just talk a little bit about your book, um, Eric. It was it was a great read and we're still finishing up. We've got a little bit left to go as part of the book club. And so um, if anyone here wants to find out more, I just put a link in the chat and you can find out everything about the Sci-Fi Book Club at sciencefriday.com slash book club. Um, so I hope you will join us there. But Robbie, Eric, thank you again so much for taking time to chat with us today. Um, where can people find out more about you um, if they want to just follow you and the work that you're doing? Robbie. Uh, so, you know, I'm on the platform, I suppose, formerly known as Twitter still. And so, uh, and yeah, there you can find my website and my work. So 
yeah, if you're still if, if anyone's still using it let, let, let's find me there please <laughs> i've heard that people are yeah eric what about you um let's see i'm oh i i posted a, a link it didn't show up um the <laughs> my <laughs> my my main um my main project right now is called currently um and it's a a network of weather newsletters um where they it's really in the spirit of this book that has followed through um to sort of providing daily weather and climate updates with the spirit of climate justice and so if you want to sign up there i write every single day um about what's happening in, in weather and climate amazing i subscribe and so i saw your newsletter from today there's there's like so much stuff i learn from currently that is just not on the news so thank you very <laughs> much for keeping me informed um i believe that you called today a perfect fall day in new york city yeah. so i'm gonna <laughs> go outside and enjoy that perfect fall day um Eric, Robbie, thank you again so much for your time. Thank you, uh, book club members. And we'll see you next month. We are reading uh, a book called The Alchemy of Us by Anisa, Anisa uh, Ramirez. And so if you're able to join us then, it's a great book, uh, just like The Future Earth is. So thank you again. We'll see you all soon. Thanks.